Hello. And books <coughs> from far away and long ago. Hello, Bix. How are you doing? Okay, we can't hear you, but it's nice to have you with us. <coughs> okay, so essentially all I'm going to do is take this word by word and comment on it. What you will notice is color coding on the Greek text. I'll explain those as we go along. Essentially, the colors are there to highlight some of the word endings, um, so they will become clear as we go through. Feel free to interrupt me at any stage as we read and pose any questions that you may have. So this is the Gospel of Mark in the most original form that we can construct it today. And uh, it begins with what is ostensibly a title. So this whole verse 1 is the title of the Gospel. It simply says, Arche to Evangeliu. So, beginning, Arche, to Evangeliu of the Gospel, Jesu Christu, of Jesus Christ, Hu Theu, Son of God. So, beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, Son of God. The Son of God would be how we would express that in English. Arche, beginning, is a first declension noun. Um, what I've done on nouns is to mark the stem letter, that's the final letter of the words stem, in red. So if it's alpha or eta, it's going to be a first declension form. So we've got arche and there's no case ending. I've marked the case endings in blue on the nouns. You'll be able to see the upsilon, which is characteristic of second declensions throughout the rest. But for the nominative singular, First declension, there's no case ending. So, arche, beginning, nominative, feminine, singular. To Evangeliu, of the gospel. The article is our telltale whenever it occurs. So, to, there's a genitive singular article. Evangeliu, gospel. Uh, the letter in red is the stem letter. It's a second declension noun ending in an omicron. And the case ending, upsilon, tells us it's genitive. The same exact reality applies to Jesu, Christu, Hu, Theu. So we've got a chain of genitives starting from here and running all the way through. Can you see when I select words on the text? No. Yes, I can. Oh, okay, good. All right. So that's helpful. So literally, Arche to Evangeliu, beginning of the Gospel, Jesu Christu, of Jesus Christ, Hu Theu, the Son of God. We often can have a genitive construction where you don't need the article to make it definite. So this would be the Son of God, even though it doesn't have an article. All the words are, are relatively common ones, so after a little bit of familiarity with the language, all of these words would probably be relatively familiar. Any comments or questions on verse 1? <coughs> Read it again, just for familiarity. Arche to Evangeliu, the beginning of the Gospel, Jesu Christu of Jesus Christ, Hiu Theu, the Son of God. Verse 2, Kathos, <coughs> Kathos means just as. Kathos, just as, it's an adverb. Adverbs often end in os. So this os ending is fairly, uh, fairly common one for adjectives. The English equivalent would be the ending ly. So many of our adjectives in English end in ly, verily, truly, etc. Um, approximately equivalent in Greek is the ending os. So kathos, just as, gegraptai. Gegraptai, usually translated in our Bibles, it is written. It is a perfect tense from the root grapho or grap. Um, <coughs> so in Greek, frequently, e and phi will interchange. That's quite a common experience to see p and phi interchange. So our root here is grapho. 
I write. Omega is an ending, so that comes off. Our stem is graph, and the p and the phi quite often interchange. So you can see here that the root or the stem has gone to grap instead of graph. Gegraptai. This duplication on the front, <coughs> ge, is a very telltale clue that it's a perfect tense, a perfect tense verb. What it does is it takes the first letter, if you haven't got to this, it takes the first letter of the word, in this case gamma, it duplicates it, and it separates the two with epsilon. This is a major, in fact, the major diagnostic for a perfect tense form. We've got ge graptai and the ge prefix. Uh, is a very strong indicator that it's a perfect tense. The Greek perfect tense is fairly... Um, rich in significance. It indicates something that happened in the past and was completed, but which has ongoing effects to the time of the person writing. So referring to scripture as it is written, it has been written, the idea is the scripture was written at some time in the past, but it remains in effect. It remains relevant, binding, authoritative, etc. So Kathos gegraptai. Gegraptai is a favorite way of introducing a quote from the Old Testament. It is written. Uh, we would find the exact same Greek expression in um, Jesus' temptations, where again and again you're going to have it is written, it is written, it is written. Gegraptai, gegraptai, gegraptai. Um, the idea is God said and his words still remain binding and authoritative. So Recognize the duplication as a sign of the perfect tense. The tie ending, the tie, uh, so on verbs, I'll mark the personal ending, which is going to tell you um, voice and person and number. The tie ending is middle passive, third person singular. So referring to the scriptures, it is written, ento hesaya, in Isaiah, to prophete, in Isaiah the prophet. Kathos gegraptai, just as it is written, ento hesaya, in Isaiah, to prophete. The little iota subscripts, you can see them under the eta, the alpha, and the two occurrences of omega ya tell you that all of these are dative singulars. That little subscript um, on any noun that you see it on is going to tell you it's a dative singular. Also indicative of the dative is the preposition n, which only takes the dative case. So anytime you've got n, you're going to have a dative following. Even if I didn't know Tohesaya was dative from its form, the n would tell me that it's dative. So just as it is written, in Tohesaya, in Isaiah, to prophete, the prophet, uh, prophete looks feminine. It's first declension. You can see the stem ending in eta. By the way, I can't separate the color of the subscript from the, the letter. So for the subscripts, I can't distinguish the markings. But the eta ending is first declension. Prophet, prophetes, is actually masculine even though it looks feminine. There are a few of those in our text today, but they're not too many in the New Testament as a whole. A clue is that the article is, is masculine. Any questions? Kathos gegraptai ento hesaya to prophete. So we've got arche to evangelio Jesu Christu, beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, hiu theu, the son of God, the ous, all telling us their genitives. Kathos gegraptai, just as it has been written, in Tohesaya, in Isaiah, to prophete the prophet, idu. Idu is an interjection, basically means behold. Behold, idu. Apostello. Anyone want to hazard a guess? Apostello look familiar?
Philip, nice to meet you. Um, I send out. Could that be that meaning? I send out. I Apostello. Send out. Absolutely. So it's from the verb apostello. This is the lexical form as well. Um, and it means I send. I send. On my color coding, green would be a connecting vowel. So what actually happens with the present tense here? I'll type it here just so that you can see. Hope you can see when I type. What actually happens in effect is that we have apostel as the root, and we add the connecting vowel omicron, and for the nominative singular, there's no case ending. And then what happens is this omega, this omicron lengthens to compensate for the loss of a case ending. So that gives us our lexical form apostello. I send. We do behold apostello ton angelon. Remember the two gummas together become ng in English wedding. Apostello ton angelon mu. I send my angel or my messenger. The new case ending is distinctive of the accusative singular. Frequently accusative singular, and the article would be a confirming diagnostic. Pro prosopusu, before, and prosopon means face, before your face, literally. So, behold, apostello ton angelon mu, I send my angel, my messenger, pro prosopusu, before the face of you, and frequently, prosopon, face, stands for the person. So we have a long tradition in English that this would be rendered something like, I send, um, sorry, are you still seeing the screen share? I send my, my messenger before yes. you. So we tend to translate this, I send my messenger before you. And the reason is the face stands for the person. It's a figure of speech. Oh, I always get synecdoche and metonymy confused. I think it's... I think it's synecdoche. Um, anyhow, so the face represents the whole person. So what he's really saying is, I'm going to send my messenger before you, but the, the idiomatic expression is before your face. Uh, and we still do the same in English today and probably every other language. So, you know, if you show somebody a picture of your face, that's synonymous with who you are. Um, but if you showed them a picture of your knee, you wouldn't be able to substitute that for yourself. Hoss is the relative pronoun who, so who, hos, kataskuase, kataskuase. All right, it's from the verb kataskuazo, meaning I prepare. Kataskuazo, meaning I prepare. A useful tip. Anytime you find a word in the Greek dictionary that a verb that ends in zeta, that zeta only occurs in the present stem. So the present tense and the imperfect tense. In all other tenses, it's going to fall away. And the reason is that the root of these words typically has a delta on the end, or at least a dental. Um, and that delta goes to zeta in the present tense. So expect that zeta in your lexicon to fall away. Um, so what happens here is we've got actually the root is kata skewad and the sigma, the red letter, is the tense formative for the future tense. So the sigma tells me it's future tense. Epsilon tells is a connecting vowel and the iota is the third person singular case ending, or not case ending, personal ending, and when these two join, when you add sigma to a delta, the delta drops out. Um, difficult to pronounce, so it just falls away. So, kadaskuase is the future active indicative third person singular. It means he will prepare. How do I know it's future? The sigma is the telltale of the future. So, get Get accustomed to the sigma addition. 
being a clue that it's a future tense. Hos kata skuase, who will prepare, ten hodon, the path or the way of you, who will prepare your way in English. Any comments, questions? Am I going too fast? Okay, I'll take silence as. I'll give a comment, Kevin, which is also fine. Eucharisto. <clears throat> so, this, of course, is the quote from Isaiah. In reality, not from Isaiah. Um, it's a combination of Malachi and Isaiah, if memory holds. Okay, so he carries on. He carries on. Still the quote from John the Baptist. We got phone. Phone is a noun. Um, just like arche, it's first declension. There's no case ending. For first declension, no case ending means nominative. So it's a nominative feminine singular, phone meaning a voice or a sound. Phone, we still get it today. Earphones are the things through which sound comes into your ears, etc. Anything with the prefix phone remains to do with sound. So phone, boontos, boontos. Now that one is going to be a bit advanced. I'll come to it in a moment. It means of one calling or crying. Ente eremo in eremos, the wilderness. N tells me it's dative, and the iota subscripts will also tell you what's following must be dative. Eremos looks masculine, doesn't it? The omega makes you think it's going to be masculine. Be careful. The article trumps what looks masculine. The feminine article clearly tells us dictionary, you'll confirm that it's one of these rare words that is second declension, but it's actually feminine. So, a voice, boontos, of one, crying, ente, in the desert or wilderness, eremo. Boontos, <coughs> if you're a little bit more advanced, boontos is a participle. Participles can function like nouns or like verbs. The telltale for the active participle is nutao. So this morpheme, yeah, this nutao is a, a telltale that you're looking at a participle. And the os is the third declension, genitive, singular, case ending. Um, participles take third declension forms for their masculine and neuter uh, forms. So what we've got is boa. There's our root, boa. And what we've added to that is connecting vowel, uh, come on, connecting vowel Omicron. The active participle morpheme is nutao, and the genitive singular case ending is os. So boa, and then alpha, Omicron, contract to omega. So that's how we get our form. If you look at what I've got highlighted, the green is the connecting vowel, which is a contracted form. Nutao tells you it's participle. Anytime you see orange on my little display, you're going to be looking at a participle. And os is genitive singular case ending. So voice of one calling or crying in the wilderness. If that's a bit beyond where you're at, don't worry about it. Participles are quite far into the language. So it's a voice of one crying in the wilderness. What's he saying? Hetoi masate. Hetoi masate. Oh, yeah. Meaning, from hetoi mazo, prepare. Remember I told you just now, if your dictionary entry has a zeta, look for that zeta to fall away in many of the other forms. Hetoi masate is an imperative verb. Sigma alpha, sa, that sigma alpha is the tense formative for the aorist tense, the default tense in Greek. So the sigma alpha tells me it's aorist, and te is the second person plural ending. So this is my personal ending, 
that is my aorist tense formative. Now the aorist tense would have an augment, meaning you would lengthen the initial vowel or you would add epsilon if it started with a consonant in the front, but only in the indicative forms. The fact that there's no augment added in the front here should alert us to the fact that this is not an indicative. Um, it is, in fact, an aorist active imperative. Our diagnostic, sigma alpha, telling us it is aorist, and the te telling us it's active second person plural. Hetoi masate, prepare as a command. Ten hodon, the way or the path, kiriu of the Lord. Genitive singular, there's our genitive singular case ending. This, of course, is accusative singular, so it's the direct object of hetoi masate. So hetoi masete, ten hodon kiriu, prepare the way of the Lord. Eutheas, eutheas, euthea is an adjective meaning straight. Uh, Got some advanced notes on that if you want them later, but <coughs> it's literally an adjective meaning straight or upright. Poiete, tas tribus autu. So we've got eutheas, poiete, tas tribus autu. Literally read, straight, make, another imperative, tas tribus, the ways or paths of him. So make his paths straight. This is from poieo, I do or I make. It's an imperative as well, but notice here we've got an aorist imperative, typically denoting a once-off kind of action, or at least an undefined action. And here we have a present imperative. So all we've done is we've taken the root poie, and we've added connecting vowel e and the second person plural um, te, these two contract to a, <coughs> so we get poi a te, it's the imperative form and it means make, make, it's a present imperative, present imperative have has some kind of an ongoing sense, keep on making, um, make repetitively, etc, his paths straight. Kevin, question? can I ask a question quickly? You may, indeed. Okay, now your screen has gone away. Okay, there it is. Um, it's gone from what I've been away. listening to, where you say where the sigma and alpha is, where you've got it in red, um, that is your future tense, right? And from the other word, your katas qase. Um, the zeta was a present. And the sigma indicated um, future tense. If I'm correct. Right. right. So, so we're comparing. Go ahead. I'll highlight the two words. So now for me, you've gone down to the other word and you're green and red and stuff. So in this katasque, would it be because it's now future tense and present because you've got red and green. So would it be like a mixture of both or what is it? Because I'm now confused. Just to have an understanding. <laughs> okay, so the sigma alone is a diagnostic for the future tense. So that so yeah, in katasquase we have just a sigma, right? And then this is the person, the case, the the connecting vowel and the ending for the personal ending. But the tense marker is the sigma. Over here, hetoi masate, the tense formative is sigma alpha. Sigma on its own is a future tense marker. Sigma alpha together is an aorist tense marker. They are two different tenses in Greek. Future in Greek is identical to the English future. It just indicates something that happens in the future. Okay. The, the aorist, if it's an indicative, is normally your past tense, but you can't give an, a command in the past tense. So when it's imperative, all imperatives are future. Just think about it in any language. You can't give a past tense command. You can't command somebody to have done something. Yes, um, that's what I'm saying. Like you're red and you're green. Because you said now where this E and I is in poite, oh, yeah. that's a present tense. Right. So, so when <coughs> tense in English means time. 
Yes. Right, but but tense. Um, <coughs> Sorry. Can, can can you just mute your mic and then I'll I'll carry okay. on. Okay. Yeah. Um, Shame. Poor Linnell is sitting in reception and got all sorts of other noises going on as well. So tense in English is very much a time thing, and and we are anchored to time. In Greek, tense only applies to indicatives. Tense in the sense of time. Um, but some of the the verb tense forms can apply in other moods like the imperative. So an imperative in Greek can be based on the present tense stem, which is what happens here, or it can be based on the aorist tense stem. The aorist indicative would be past tense, but when you base them on different stems, it more refers to the kind of action. An aorist tense does not make any indication that the action is ongoing. It tends to refer more to a once-off type of action or to action without reference to whether it's repeating or not. Whereas in an imperative, a present tense stem would strongly indicate something that's repetitive. So in the indicative mood, which is the mood of fact, tense is similar to our English tense. But the moment we use the, the tense forms to build other word categories, in this case imperatives, command words, the significance is not time, because all imperatives are future t in time orientation, um, but the kind of action being portrayed. Present tense stem, repetitive action, aorist tense stem, um, probably referring to one sort of kind of action. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you, Kevin. Okay, so in terms of diagnostics, sigma on its own is a strong clue that you're looking at a future tense verb. Sigma alpha will be an aorist stem verb, um, and the absence of those is more diagnostic of a present tense. All right, so let's recap that. We've got Arche to Evangelio, beginning of the gospel, Jesu Christu, of Jesus Christ, Heu Son of God. Kathos, just as. Gegraptai, it is written. Notice the reduplication, tells me it's a perfect. Ento Hesaya, in Hazaya, to prophete, the prophet. Idu, behold, just an interjection. Apostello, I send, or I am sending. Ton Angelon, the messenger, mu, of me, of me my messenger. Pro, preposition, meaning before. Prosopusu, your face, a figure of speech meaning before you. Hos, who, kataskuase, future tense, who will prepare. Ten hodon, the way of you, who will prepare your way. Phone, a voice. Boontos, advanced word for the time being, of one calling or crying, ente eremo, ente eremo, in the desert. Hetoi masate, prepare, two Greek words that both basically mean prepare, kataskiwaso and hetoi mazo. So hetoi masate, prepare ten hodon kiriu, prepare the way of the Lord. In, I mean, literally prepare the way of Lord, um, where Kuriu would have come from a Hebrew Yahweh. Eutheas, straight, poiete, make, with some sense of repetition or continuity because it's a present imperative. Tas tribus out to his paths. So straight, make his paths. Now notice something here. Eutheas, straight, is the first word in its clause, even though it's an adjective modifying ways or paths. Greek has the ability to move things out of their logical position in a sentence. And if it takes a word like this that you would expect to come later in the sentence and puts it right in the front, it's making it bold and italics in modern day um, script equivalents. Okay? Any questions? Can I go on to verse 4? Okay, I'll take silence as consent. Please tell me if I'm going too fast. I hope there's something in here for different levels. Egeneto. Egeneto. 
The first thing I want you to notice on Egeneta is the epsilon on the front. So epsilon is called an augment. It's added onto the front of many verbs to indicate past time. Egeneta. The epsilon prefix tells, tells us it's past time. If the verb started with a vowel, it wouldn't add an epsilon, it would lengthen that vowel. So alpha would become eta, omicron would become omega, it would make it a longer vowel. But if it starts with a consonant, then the epsilon added to the front is a past time marker. It only applies to indicatives and it'll normally tell you what's following is an aorist tense, sometimes an imperfect tense form. In this case, it's a second aorist. It means um, came, again eto, came, or he came, Ioannes, John, ho baptizon. You can see this is from baptizo, baptizo meaning to baptize. I told you earlier, if you see orange on my little displays, you're looking at a participle. Now the normal participle morpheme is nutau. So that nutau, you'll see it over here, active participles. To tell you it's an active participle, Greek adds nutau onto a verb form. So the nutau would tell us it's a participle, but there's an anomaly related to the letter tau. If there's no case ending, as there is in the nominative singular here, there's no case ending, tau will never stand on the end of a word. You will never find a Greek word that ends in tau, our letter T. Search in vain, you won't find one. Because any time tau ends a word, it falls away. So the actual word here, baptizont, is shortened to baptizon. And it means one who baptizes. Ho baptizon, the one who baptizes. So he came, Ioannes, ho baptizon, the one who baptizes. This is telling us which John. So John came, which John? The one who baptizes. John who baptizes came. Again, it's Ioannes, ho baptizon. N, you know a dative is going to follow, and the two. Iota subscripts will confirm it. He came in te eremo in the desert. Kerison, uh, my mistake. This should be this should be orange. So we got the same thing going on here. The participle morpheme would be nutau. There's no case ending in the nominative masculine singular for the participles, so it would have looked like this, and the tau won't stand on the end. So he came preaching. Kerusoon, from Keruso I preach. Preaching, baptisma. Baptisma, not hard to figure out what the word means. Baptism. It's a third declension form. When you've got a third declension noun, you have to learn, so in the dictionary you'll see nominative singular, genitive singular, and an article to tell you its gender. The, sec the genitive singular is the critical form. If you drop the genitive case ending os, you'll get the root of the word. The root is baptismat. Baptismat. Okay? even though in your dictionary it's listed as baptisma. Why baptismat? Well, the answer is tau will not stand on the end of a word, so when no case ending is added, the tau drops off to give us baptisma. This could be nominative or accusative singular. In this case, preaching a baptism it's going to be accusative singular. It's the direct object of the word preaching. So John came, the one who baptizes um, in the wilderness, baptisma metanoias, of repentance. Genitive singular case ending, first declension noun, meaning repentance, metanoia. So that's our 
our um, stem stem vowel for a first declension, the alpha, and the genitive singular case ending is sigma. So preaching baptisma metanoias, a baptism of repentance, ace unto or for aphesin. Aphesin is a confusing third declension word. It means forgiveness. Um, even without knowing too much of the detail, you can see at a glance that nu would suggest it's accusative. Estelle, what else suggests it's accusative? <laughs> that was funny. We heard absolutely nothing, although I think you were speaking. Right, ace. The preposition ace takes an accusative noun following it. So ace afesin, unto repentance or for, sorry, unto forgiveness or for forgiveness, hamartion of sins. The genitive plural own ending is fairly strong as an indicator of what you're looking at. So, again, it are Ioannes, or baptizo, John, the one who baptizes, came ente eremo, in the wilderness, keruson, preaching, baptisma metanoias, a baptism of repentance, eis afesin, unto forgiveness, hamartion, of sins. Any questions? One of the theological questions here would be what is the relationship between the baptisma, baptism, and afesin, for forgiveness. So taken at face value, it might appear that baptism in some sense produces forgiveness. Well, that's a problematic idea in Christian theology, so it's rejected by almost everybody, rightly so, um, and we would look elsewhere for the theological explanation of the grammar. <clears throat> All right, Kai, verse 5. Kai, most common word in Greek aside from ho, uh, not sure which of those occurs more often, actually. Kai, exe porueto. Exe porueto. This comes from the word ek, meaning out of, and the verbal stem, poru. In our dictionary form would be ek poruamai. Sorry, not with the new on the end. Ek poruamai. So there's our root basically. What's happened is you can see that epsilon added between the preposition and the actual stem of the of the verb. That epsilon that's added in between is the past tense marker, the augment. Alright. So ek e poru and then this ending here is an imperfect third person singular form. So the e is a connecting vowel, to is the third person singular middle passive form. Um, so this means and, he, she or it was going out. It's imperfect tense. Imperfect implies an ongoing or repeated action in the past time. The augment tells us it's something happening in the past time, and the tense form tells us it's repetitive. So, ex eporueto, and he, she, or it was going out, prosauton, to him, pasa he judaia chora. Pasa means all, he judaia chora, the Judean region or country. So, he came preaching a baptism of repentance and it was going out 
cross out on to him, Pasa he Judea Chora, all the region of Judea, all the Judean, all the people from that region. Kai and Hoi, Jerusalemitai, Jerusalemitai, the Jerusalemites, Pantes, all of them. Hoi Jerusalemitai, Pantes, all the Jerusalemites. Kai, Ebaptizonto, they were being baptized. Epsilon, the augment, is a past tense marker. There are only two past tenses in Greek, really. Maybe the perfect goes there a little bit, but not, not entirely. The two past tenses are the aorist tense, which would indicate something that happened in the past time, typically without reference to duration, so not in implying that it was repeated or ongoing. And the imperfect tense, which implies um, that the action was repeated or ongoing in some sense. Here we have baptizo. Remember I told you about the zeta? Let's go up to the two forms we saw earlier. If our word ends in zeta, that zeta only occurs in verb forms that are built on the imperfect, sorry, the present stem. That zeta drops out in all the other stems. So for the future tense, the sigma overwrites it. And for the aorist tense, the sigma alpha overwrites it. So when I come to e baptizonto, I can see it's past time. That tells me with certainty it's either aorist or imperfect tense. Aorist would imply it's a, without reference to repetition, whereas imperfect would imply it's in some sense repeated. If this was aorist, I would have expected to see a sigma alpha overwriting my zeta here and that would have had other changes. But the lack of sigma alpha would tell us fairly clearly that this is not aorist. It must therefore be um, imperfect. All right, so they were going out to him, imperfect tense. The idea is people kept going out to him. You can picture crowds over time kept going out to him and they were being baptized with the sense of repetition. Not the same people being baptized again and again, of course, but there was a steady stream of people going out to John, Kai e baptizonto, and they were being baptized, hupautu, by him, ento yordane, hupautu by him, ento yordane, in the Jordan Potamo River. Easy way to remember Potamos. Just think of Hippo, horse, Potamos River. Hippopotamos, a horse river. A river horse is a hippopotamus. Okay. <coughs> Ex homologumenoi, another of those pesky participles. Um, in this stage, meaning confessing. I'm not going to explain the form at the moment. We can do that another time. But so they were going out to him. They were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, ex homologumenoi, while confessing. While confessing tas hamartias, the sins, auton of them, while confessing their sins. I want to draw your attention to hamartias here. Uh, did I see one earlier? No, I didn't. Okay, ignore me. That's a different word. All right. So let's read it again. Kai exe porueto, and it was going out to him, prosauton to him, pasa, all, he judaya chora, the Judean region, kai and hoi Jerusalemitai, and all, the Jerusalemites, or and the Jerusalemites, Pantes, all of them, Kai e baptizonto, and they were being baptized, hupautu, by him, into Jordane Potamo, in the Jordan Potamo River, Hippopotamo River Horse. 
ex homologuminoi while confessing tas amartia sauton vesens. Calls for comments or questions? Can you hear me, Pauline? I can hear you. Okay, the answer, I think we didn't hear it previously, the answer to your question for verse 4, um, what other indicator is that that is a, um, a cubitus is the preposition A, that means the object. Yes, indeed. So very often the presence of a preposition will tell you definitively what um, you're looking at. Uh, well, what case is going to follow because some prepositions will only take a certain case. N and A are two of them. Okay. Are you still seeing my screen when I highlight it, by the way? Yes, Luther. Yes. All right, great. So if I highlight Kai in verse 6, you'll see the highlight and you can see I'm reading verse 6. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right, great. When I flick over, it looks static. Let's do verse 6. That might be as far as we'll have time to get. So Kai Ain, Ain, he was. He was. He, she, or it was. Ain. Uh, very common. You can just learn the form. Ain. Kai ein hoyoanes and John was. Kai ein hoyoanes and John was. Once you've introduced a character in, in Greek, let's go and find the first reference to John by name. Okay, so here we've got hoyoanes. I just want to show you something that happens quite commonly in Greek narrative. Here's the first explicit reference to John by name. The first time you introduce a person in a Greek narrative, it's normally without the article. So you can see in our narrative in verse 4, the first time John is mentioned, it's just Ioannes, not Hoioannes. Subsequently, in the same passage, if you want to refer back to a person you've already introduced, you add the article to his name. So, Hoyoanes. The article, in a sense, refers to the John. Which one? Well, the one we've named earlier. So, the article tells me which John am I talking about? Well, the one that I introduced a little bit earlier in the passage. And if there are subsequent references to Ioannes, it'll probably be with the article present because he's already been introduced. So, that happens fairly common. Why is the article here? Yeah, because it's pointing back to the John that was introduced in verse 4. Kai en ho Ioannes en de dumenos. I won't labor this, but there are a few clues here that even if you've not learned tenses, would be telltale. Remember I told you the perfect tense, so our, our ver, ver, ver word here is en duo, where en is a preposition and the root is du. The perfect tense is formed by taking the first letter of the root, duplicating it, and separating it with e. So this de, from du to de du, is absolutely telltale for a perfect tense form. Whatever this is, even if I don't know what it is, whatever it is, this duplication with de tells me it's a perfect something. And uh, the men is the morpheme for a middle passive participle. So just learning duplication, reduplication with epsilon and men as being a diagnostic for a middle passive participle, I would immediately know this is a perfect middle passive participle. Um, that would be enough to tell me that. For now, we won't go any deeper than that. That means John was clothed. The word means clothed. Clothed with trichas, trichas from trix meaning hair, with hair camelu, with hairs of a camel. So this is trichas, literally hairs, plural, camelu, of a camel, kai, 
zonane and zonane from zone meaning belt and a belt dermatinane made of leather you can see derma from which we get skin so and a belt dermatinane made of leather peritenos fun around his waist out to his waist <clears throat> Kai is thorn and eating from is theon. You, if you learn this in the dictionary, by the way, you're going to learn a word. Uh, wrong language. Is theo. So if you learn the word for to eat in the Greek dictionary, it's going to appear as is theo. Quite often that iota drops out. So you will encounter is theo and is so, don't be surprised. So what we've got here is S Theo. The iota's dropped out, um, and I got confused with my colours here. So this here is the participle morpheme. I've got it in pink. It should be in orange. Uh, but the participle morpheme basically new tau, telling me it's an active participle. But remember, the tau won't stand on the end. So he was wearing certain things, one participle, and another participle, he was eating akridas, akridas meaning locusts, kai meli and honey agrion growing in the field or wild. Probably that's as far as we have time for. Any comments? Okay, we'll pick up next time at verse number 7 and see how far we can move through this. Don't feel obliged to try and remember everything or understand every detail. Uh, the idea is uh, just to expose you to a lot of it and explain bits and pieces, and over time things will hopefully start to stick. Nice to see some old faces like uh, <coughs> Bert and Andrew. Not that you guys are old, just um, from past Greek journeys. Thanks, everyone. Uh, hopefully, see you same time next week. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Kevin. Thank, Thank you very much, Kevin. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye.